hope you are fine. Here it's very hot here in Italy. I don't know where in your, in your place, but uh, the summer is starting. Anyway, we will have uh, two more tea breaks uh, uh, in um, next week and uh, the week after, and then we will close for the summer holidays. Today is a great pleasure to have Jesse Taller with us. Uh, he already uh, has been in the, the GGI lecturing at the, at the school uh, on uh, the theory of fundamental interactions. And just before this, uh, uh, this talk we are discussing, when was it? Actually, it was just before uh, we closed, just before the COVID emergency. So he promised to come back to the DGI as soon as it would be possible. So thank you, Jesse, again for uh, being here with us. And I leave uh, Francesco for the introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefania. And good afternoon or morning or evening, depending on where you are. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jesse Thaler today. Uh, Jesse received his undergraduate degree from Brown University in 2002 and his PhD from Harvard University in 2006. Afterward, he was a Miller Fellow at the University of California in Berkeley, and then he joined the MIT Center for Theoretical Physics as a faculty member in 2010. Now he's an associate professor at MIT, and more recently, he was uh, the inaugural director of the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. The spectrum of Jessic's activity is remarkably broad. Uh, since his very first days as a graduate student, he worked on a wide range of topics on the physics beyond the standard model, ranging from the theoretical frameworks for theories of the Fermi scale to their collider signatures. And in the last few years, his main research activities has been on collider physics. Uh, Jesse gave outstanding contribution to our understanding of jet substructure, and he currently fuses techniques from quantum field theory and machine learning to address open questions in fundamental physics. Collider is far from being the only research activity, and uh, among other several contributions, Jesse was one of the promoters of the Abracadabra experiment that is currently in operation searching for lax and dark matter. Jesse's research was recognized by many awards. The list is too long to give it completely here. I just mentioned the DOE Early Career Research Award, the Presidential Early Career Award from the White House, and the Sloan Research Fellowship. He also won several awards for his fantastic job as a teacher and as a mentor. And on this matter, on a more personal note, I was very lucky to have Jesse as my PhD advisor. So I'm looking forward to hearing today's talk on the hidden geometry of particle collisions. Jesse will monitor the chat. If there is any urgent question during the talk, feel free to ask in the chat if it's immediate. And then we will have a Q&A session after Jesse's talk where you can unmute yourself and ask questions via your voice. On behalf of the organizing committee, I thank Jesse for accepting our invitation and uh, the stage is all yours. Great. Well, thanks, Francesco, and thanks, everyone at GGI. It's really a pleasure to be back virtually um, and, and looking forward to hopefully uh, being back uh, next year. Uh, there's likely going to be a machine learning workshop at, at GGI that I hope many of you will be have a chance to, uh, to attend. Um, and then, uh, Francesco, also a uh, pleasure having you as a graduate student and, uh, and glad I get to see your face virtually. I'm looking forward to the time we can actually see each other again in person. Um, so the title of this talk is The Hidden Geometry of particle collisions, and I'll, I'll explain that title in a moment. Um, but first, let me just use this opportunity to do shameless advertising uh, for the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, which we call IFI, uh, which is a joint venture between folks at MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts. And what we're trying to do is advance physics knowledge and galvanize AI research innovation, and really have a fusion between these two uh, areas of research. And in trying to think about what uh, talk I would give for this, this colloquium today, um, let me give you a, a quick view of what I'm not going to talk about, uh, which is in some sense an easier story to tell because it involves a collision between concepts from high energy physics and concepts from machine learning. So again, this is not the talk that you're going to hear today. Um, but my uh, uh, oh, now former students, uh, Patrick Kamitsky and Eric Matodiev, uh, taking principles from physics that I'll talk about a little bit today about the robustness of energy flow and about infrared and collinear safe observables coming from the high energy physics side. The power of point cloud learning, things that we learned from the computer science literature, 
colliding together to give a new neural network architecture, uh, which you can download like right now if you want to analyze collision debris using both of these principles fused together, that gives rise to psychedelic images that actually uh, was used as the uh, poster for a workshop that's going on uh, this week, in fact, at, at Mainz. And this is a talk that I'm not going to give, but it's this is the easy talk to give because it's taking elements from high energy physics, elements from machine learning, fusing them together and looking at the results of the synthesis. Um, but I've decided not to give this talk. I'm gonna give a more difficult talk at some level um, because it's going to be less familiar and maybe not at all obvious why the particular machine learning technique that I'm going to present to you has anything to do with collider physics. And so we're gonna be talking about optimal transport for high energy physics. Optimal transport is a, is a field uh, that uh, actually started off in uh, work by a French mathematician Monge in the, in the 1780s about literally moving dirt around. What's the best way of building embankments uh, from troughs of dirt? And you know what is moving earth or what is moving dirt around have anything to do with collider physics? It seems not at all relevant. It seems, uh, at least certainly from, from my perspective, what could this possibly have to do with quantum field theory? And the surprise is that indeed it does have something to do with quantum field theory. And the goal of this, uh, of this talk is to explain what this connection is. So the title of my talk is The Hidden Geometry of Particle Collisions. And in some sense, I'm gonna step you through in kind of three uh, steps in this talk, starting from the manifest geometry of particle collisions, things that we're used to. You know, we're used to thinking about collision debris at colliders like the LHC. We're used to thinking about the directions that particles go in their various angles. We're used to using techniques like clustering. And these are kind of standard geometric data analysis strategies. From this, we're gonna use this language of optimal transport to define an emergent geometry, um, one that doesn't have coordinate systems in the way that we're used to talking about. And then this is going to take us full circle to what I'm calling a hidden geometry, uh, because this geometric structure that I'm going to explain that comes from the optimal transport literature turns out to be related in a surprising way to things that we've already known about from collider physics and quantum field theory for the past half century. And so um, just to kind of give you the punchline already at the beginning, what I'll try to explain is that indeed six decades of collider physics can be translated into a new geometric language. And the concept of infrared and collinear safety and the way that we tame infinities in quantum field theory up through event shapes that we use to uh, you know, learn about the dynamics of the strong force to jet algorithms, which are in widespread use of the LHC to jet substructure, which is where I kind of entered into this field, even to some very practical experimental minded things like pilot mitigation. These are things that have a natural geometric language once you accept this picture of, of optimal transport. Um, and that's my goal uh, today is to try to explain this connection and explain why I think this is a really rich language uh, for us to explore for quantum field theory and collider physics with many, many open uh, questions uh, left to explore. So the remainder of my talk is gonna be, uh, as I mentioned, in three parts. So, so first, uh, going with the energy flow and uh, reminding you or telling you about uh, one way of processing collider information by studying the flow of energy from the collision point off to an idealized detector at infinity and using that as the starting point for asking if i put on a data analysis or data science hat what's the best way of processing or what's a way of processing data from colliders like the lhc then we're going to talk about this emergent geometry that comes from this concept um, from the optimal transport literature known as the earth movers distance which we adapted to particle physics as the energy movers distance and then show you how this distance, which, you know, when you first see it, it seems like, you know, one of many distances that you could define. It's not at all obvious why this distance of all the distances should be at all related to things we care about in, uh, in quantum field theory and collider physics, why that actually does connect to things that we are more familiar with and revealing this hidden geometry and connecting to the past half century of, of developments in the field. So that's where we're going uh, in this talk today. So um, maybe just to take a little bit of a step back uh, to, to particle physics 101. This is supposed to be a little more of a, of a kind of a colloquium level. Um, let me just remind you some facts about, about the standard model and the way that the standard model manifests itself uh, at, at, at colliders. So we're all familiar with the fundamental ingredients of, of the standard model, uh, the, the quark shown in orange, the lepton shown in green, the force carry shown in blue, and the Higgs boson, of course, at the center of the standard model. Um, but one of the things that we have to remember is that very few of these fundamental particles do I see directly. 
Um, and part of the reason why machine learning um, has risen in importance for collider physics is that there's many inference tasks that you would like to, uh, to accomplish to basically map between the measurements that you're making uh, at final states of colliders back to the standard model uh, ingredients and uh, the possible extensions. So only uh, essentially photons, electrons, and muons, only the ones carrying electromagnetic interactions, only these are the ones that are seen directly in your, in your collider experiment. Everything else has to be inferred um, either from the fragmentation of jets um, for the fact that quarks and gluons combine by the strong force to make composite hadrons, and those are the things that actually hit your detector, um, or unstable particles like top quarks, uh, tau leptons, WZ bosons, Higgs bosons, which uh, can only be inferred by their decay products. And of course, neutrinos, which sail right through your detector um, and, uh, uh, and can only be inferred by their absence. So already there are a variety of inference tasks that we have to do to connect the particles that we actually see in our colliders uh, to what's actually going on in terms of fundamental short distance physics. To add to the complication, we actually have to detect those particles. And at the LHC, we have heterogeneous uh, detector subsystems where you have to synthesize information from tracking, calorimetry, muon systems to figure out what goes on. And every 25 nanoseconds at the LHC, you take these beautiful uh, event displays and somehow have to decide, one, whether the uh, uh, event is worth keeping, uh, and two, what's actually going on in that event. Uh, and again, my area of specialty are these jets, these collimated sprays of particles, which are proxies for short distance quarks and, and gluons. Now, if you're thinking about collider data from a data science perspective, you have to decide how do you want to represent the information that you're studying at colliders? What's the representation that you want to use? Um, what information do you want to keep? What information do you want to, to, to not pay attention to? And the starting point of this whole investigation is a restriction of the information that I'm going to pay attention to. I'm not going to look at the full information that you can gather, gather from a, a collision event. I'm going to restrict to a subset. Now, it's a theoretically motivated subset, but a subset nonetheless. And the subset of information that I'm going to be focusing on is the flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity. And this particular way of representing information emphasizes the principle from quantum field theory of infrared and collinear safety, which I'll review uh, in a moment. So again, let me just tell you the same story I told you already, uh, but just say it again. So we slam together protons at the LHC. Uh, very often we make high energy quarks and gluons, which shower via a parton showering process to create more quarks and gluons, which eventually can find to form the composite hadrons, the pions and kaons that eventually hit your detector. And actually trying to predict this precise uh, framework of you know, exactly how uh, quarks and gluons evolve, exactly how this hadronization goes, and exactly you know, what you see in your detector. This is a complicated uh, generative process to understand. But one thing that we can do to simplify our life, um, and this is uh, done all the time when we're doing theoretical calculations, is again focusing on, from the theory perspective, the flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity. So this is a real quantum mechanical operator, um, the energy flow operator. It's built out of the stress energy tensor T mu nu. Uh, you get the zero component, that's the energy. You have the I component, that's the flow of energy. And the flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity is robust to hadronization and detector effects. So what we would say is that if you're studying this energy flow, then you have power corrections in the strong uh, confinement scale uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, perturbative predictions made using this object. And this is an object that's well-defined for massless gauge theories and doesn't suffer from the ambiguities that one has if one's trying to study an S matrix element. This energy flow object has, has been uh, in the literature for a while. Um, uh, Katchoff did work in the 1990s to really emphasize this way of representing information. Uh, it was made maybe more popular uh, by Hoffman and Maldacena, who used this to study conformal collider physics. And there's been a resurgence of interest in multipoint energy correlators uh, in the past few years. Um, and let me just give you an example, not having to do with machine learning, of uh, a standard thing that people do with this energy flow operator that we can now take into the modern era. So again, just to say, this is a restriction of information. I'm not focusing on charge. I'm not focusing on flavor. I'm just focusing on the flow of energy. And that's a restriction of information that will turn out to be very relevant for the rest of the story that I'm going to tell. So you can, of course, complain, hey, you're losing information about what's going on. Indeed. Um, but there's going to be a benefit from that in the types of new data analysis strategies that are enabled by this restriction. Uh, so let me tell you a non-machine learning uh, way of uh, using this uh, energy flow operator. 
And so something that we've already known uh, since the 1970s is that you can study uh, correlations of these energy flow operators. So you can take a jet, you can put two of these uh, uh, energy flow objects, and you can study whether as I move them closer or farther apart, whether or not the existence of energy in one part of your detector is correlated with having energy in another part of your detector. And this has been done in studies at lepton colliders for, for, for decades. Um, and we, uh, using public data from the CMS experiment, uh, Patrick Kamitsky, Ian Moult, and Hua Jingzhu and I, uh, we've been studying energy-energy correlators at the LHC, where you see this peak at zero angle when you bring these two uh, objects close together. And this corresponds to the collinear singularity structure of, of gauge theories. This is something that's very uh, well known. And we see it now in public collider data from, from the LHC. Um, but what's kind of exciting, once you, as a theorist, have access to the data directly, you can start to do just you know, different types of manipulations. And a fun manipulation that we did is take this plot, which is relatively standard, and actually plot it in a logarithmic space. And when you plot it in a logarithmic space, you see this fascinating behavior where you see this plateau structure and this plateau structure um, is the partonic phase of QCD where the fundamental degrees of freedom are quarks and gluons and you have a quasi scale invariant theory. And then at an angular scale that corresponds to QCD confinement, you have this change in the power law. And this change in the power law corresponds to this hadronic phase where we basically just have a gas of pions and kaons. And so it's fascinating that this idea of energy correlators is now kind of coming back in an interesting way and allow us to see this beautiful phase transition between the protonic phase and hadronic phase of, uh, of, of QCD. Okay, so this has absolutely nothing to do with machine learning. This is just taking technology from, from the 1970s and, and, and bringing it into the, to the modern era. Um, let me now say what this looks like if you now put on a machine learning hat. So if you put on a machine learning hat and you're trying to explain what this energy flow operator is, to someone who's used to, you know, doing, you know, image processing or natural language processing in the artificial intelligence community. What they'd say is, oh, you're trying to represent your data. They don't know anything about quantum mechanical operators. <laughs> they would just say, you're trying to represent your data as a weighted point cloud. So what do I mean by that? So a point cloud is just a collection of points in space. So you can imagine the trajectories of particles having momentum, in the X, Y, and Z components. And if you have a bunch of bundles of particles going in the X, Y, and Z components, a machine learning person would call that a point cloud. And there's many interesting point cloud uh, uh, machine learning strategies that people have developed, including ones uh, based on graph neural networks. But if you then say, I really want to have things that are infrared and collinear safe, or ones that are based on this energy flow picture, then those points have to be weighted by their energy. So instead of having momentum in the X, Y, and Z direction, what I really have is energy, that's the weight, moving in some direction. So I have energy weighted directions. And this energy weighted direction, this weight means that if the energy goes to zero, it doesn't contribute. Or if I have bundles of energy that are all going in the same direction, that is they're collinear, then I can't tell the difference between one particle versus multiple particles all traveling in the same direction. Or an equivalent way of saying what we're doing with these energy weighted directions is that we're focusing on kind of idealized calorimeter image of what's going on. So equivalently, I can think about having a density of energy. So I have an energy density on my detector cylinder here because I'm going to be focusing on jets in this talk. I have this square slice of the detector. And then I'm looking at the direction that particles are going. Those are going to be points in this energy density. And in this representation, the size of the dot corresponds to how much energy is flowing there. And by doing this restriction to this energy flow, which again is motivated by quantum field theory, I'm changing my data structure from generic point clouds to these weighted point clouds, or equivalently, these energy densities. And so when you're restricted to infrared and collinear safe information, jets or even full collider events are naturally represented as energy densities. And based on what I've told you, it's actually not obvious how to include unsafe information in this picture, um, since in the context of massless gauge theories, uh, it's not obvious how to include unsafe information in this picture. Um, uh, so, sorry, since the, the flow of charge and flavor is, is theoretically delicate. Um, so one of the questions in the chat is, what about invisible energy? So for the purposes of this talk, um, uh, invisible energy uh, will just be treated as contributing nothing to the energy flow. Um, so for example, if you have neutrinos in the final state, those will not be included. And um, this will come back a little bit later in situations where we're going to talk about what happens when you don't have energy momentum conservation. Um, indeed, if I'm only focusing on a single patch of my detector, uh, only on a single jet, 
then of course I don't have full energy momentum balance because I'm only focusing on a subset. So you can think about invisible energy as also being like just not part of the subset of, of flow that I'm paying attention to. Okay, so this is a restriction, a theoretically motivated restriction. And now the question is, okay, so where is this going to take us? You know, what is this restriction bias? Besides the fact that this is the thing that we know how to calculate in perturbative field theory, you know, why is this energy density representation? Why is there anything to learn from this? So um, the, 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 the alien technology <laughs> that, that we learned that I had no idea about until I started uh, you know, talking to my friends who are outside of the particle physics uh, world and, and talking to people who, who uh, work in computational geometry. So if you ask your, your local computational geometry expert about data analysis strategies to process densities, you say, what I have is a density. In our case, it's an energy density, but you know, it could be a probability density. It could be the dark matter density in the universe, you know, anything that's a density. And you ask them, hey, how do you process densities? They'll say, oh, don't you know about this thing called the earth movers distance? To which my answer was, I had no idea there was this thing called the earth movers distance. Tell me about this earth movers distance. So um, as I mentioned, this has a long history going back to the 1780s about transporting dirt around. And in, in French, uh, the word for a mound of dirt and a trough are given the word deble and remble. So Monge's work in 1780s is about basically the optimal transport of of, uh, of, of mounds of dirt to troughs of dirt in the context of building embankments and things like that. Uh, it was made mathematically maybe more precise uh, by Kantorovich, and then it's given the name of the Wasserstein metric uh, uh, based on Wasserstein work in the, in the 1960s. It comes into the machine learning world in the context of image processing applications, where um, for image processing, you can imagine the pixels of an image as like corresponding to the amount of dirt that you have. So if you have a white pixel, that's no dirt. If you have a black pixel, that's a mound of dirt local, localized to that pixel. And if you want to do image processing or image vision tasks, you might want to compare two images and ask, hey, are these images similar or not based on whether or not they uh, uh, are, are similar by this optimal transport measure? So what is this earth movers distance? Again, earth uh, also meaning dirt. So what is the dirt movers distance? It's the minimum amount of work. That is, if you are the earth mover and you had a shovel, how much work that is how much stuff of dirt in your shovel times distance to move it uh, do you need to make one distribution look like another one? Um, and again, this has nothing specifically to do with dirt or, or, or images. This is anytime you have some notion of an additive weight, in our case, that's gonna be energy, some notion of a ground distance, that is how hard is it to move things left or right? And if you have these ingredients, some amount of stuff and, and some notion of distance, then this gives you a distance between distributions. And so the difficulty of making this red blob turn into this, uh, so this blue blob turn into this red blob, that is something that you can give a number to. Um, and that number is called either the earth movers distance or the von Bosserstein metric, um, or more generally, it it's, uh, corresponds to solving an optimal transport problem. So um, in the chat, a uh, uh, question came up, is this related to other measures of distance between distributions like the KL divergence? And the answer is it is the complement to KL divergence. And in fact, the reason why this is so popular uh, is shown by this plot here. So this EMD is a horizontal comparison to between distributions. So if I have one Gaussian in blue and the other Gaussian in red, and I want to know how difficult it would be to morph the red to the blue, what I'm doing is I'm comparing these distributions horizontally. And in fact, if I take these Gaussians and I pull them farther and farther apart, it's harder and harder to make the red and the blue match onto each other. By contrast, uh, statistical divergences like the KL divergence, those are a vertical comparison. That is, you integrate over the x-axis of the difference between the vertical heights logarithmically scaled of your two distributions. And this vertical comparison suffers from the following problem. Uh, if you take your distributions and you pull them apart so that they're not overlapping, if I keep pulling them apart, they're still not overlapping. And so KL divergence basically says that distributions are far apart, no matter how far apart they really are. Whereas with this horizontal comparison, this earth movers distance, um, as you start pulling them farther apart, you get more and more and more separation. And so there's a lot more dynamic range in this horizontal comparison compared to the vertical comparison. And so if you look at the machine learning literature, 
you'll see that people have developed all sorts of various techniques in machine learning. And now you're seeing those same techniques get the word Wasserstein slapped on top of it. So you'll hear, hear about Wasserstein autoencoders or Wasserstein generative adversarial networks. And that Wasserstein corresponds to using this horizontal comparison instead of the, 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 the vertical comparison that is swapping EMD for something like KL divergence. And the reason, again, is because you have this larger dynamic range when distributions become far apart. Um, and, and in Q&A, we can talk about why, nevertheless, when we're doing uh, maximum likelihood techniques, we still use uh, vertical comparisons. Uh, and, and that's an actually interesting question about why we still use things like the KL divergence, given this dynamic range uh, opportunity from the EMD. So you may or may not have heard of this Earth Movers distance. Uh, uh, it shows up now increasingly in data science applications. Again, it was new to me. It's not at all obvious that this is, should be useful in particle physics, apart from a replacement for the KL divergence. And as a replacement, um, uh, this Wasserstein metric has been used in various high energy physics applications, uh, from generative modeling tasks uh, to characterization of beyond the standard model physics. Um, and then last week at this Mainz workshop that I, I mentioned, uh, Jessica Howard and, uh, and Nathaniel Craig talked about using this Wasserstein metric for simulation unfolding tasks, as well as for jet classification tasks. And again, it it's showing up in our field because of this robustness to, um, to distributions that are, are far apart from each other. Um, so what we did um, is we said, OK, there's this Earth movers distance. Let's adapt this to particle physics, taking this energy flow concept, this energy densities is the way that we want to represent our information. And let's now develop the energy movers distance. This again was developed with Patrick Kaminsky and Eric Matodia. So um, I'll show you a movie about this uh, in, in another slide, but uh, let's just show a static frame of it first. So we have two jets here. So again, imagine taking your detector. I'm now looking down at an individual jet. I've taken a square slice of my detector, and I'm looking at the energy flow into that square slice of the detector. I have a top jet, or one top jet, from a, from a, a Lorentz-boosted uh, top quark decaying in a characteristic three-pronged pattern shown in red, another one shown in blue. And the black lines are showing the path that someone, if they wanted to take their shovel and move the red dirt to the blue dirt, what path they would go, where the intensity of that line shows you basically how much dirt they're moving. So we have an optimal transport between energy flows, and it consists of two terms. One term is the energy. This is the FIJ, basically the minimum amount of energy that I need to, to, to move around to make one distribution look like another, constrained to be positive and constrained that all the dirt needs to move from one distribution to the other the uh, rapidity azimuth distance that I have to move it, that's theta. And this product is the product of the amount of stuff times the distance it has to go. That's the cost to move energy. Um, but of course, in particle physics, we have situations where the energies aren't the same, or in cases where we have invisible energy, there might be a mismatch. So there's also a penalty associated with the cost to create energy. Um, and then there's a, a relationship between these uh, set by this parameter r, uh, which later on the, in the talk, this will actually corresponds to uh, a, a jet radius parameter. So the, 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 the jet radii, which is a, an arbitrary choice you have to make when you're doing jet analyses, that shows up an arbitrary choice about how you want to balance moving energy versus creating energy. And what you get is this EMD, it's in units of GEV. Um, and uh, we have the, it's, it's, a, it's a pairwise function of one energy flow and another energy flow. Um, and this theta, by the way, is defined, this is a question in the chat, this theta is defined in a way that it's always positive. So um, this is always a, uh, a positive distance that I'm moving. And this EMD, again, you might ask, why am I doing this, apart from the fact that my computational geometry experts are telling me that I should. It has a really interesting feature. This optimal transport distance, once you put these two terms in there for an appropriate choice of R, defines a metric on the space of events. So I need to be a little bit careful about this word metric. Um, when physicists hear metric, they usually think about general relativity and, and, and metrics in that context, in the context of differential geometry. Here, we're talking about metrics in terms of just pairwise distances. Um, and this pairwise distances, for appropriate choice of R, um, uh, satisfies the triangle inequality. That is, if I go from the red energy flow, you can think about that as mapping to a, a, a single point in this abstract emergent space that I'm going to define. The blue energy flow turns into a single point in this abstract space. And the optimal transportation plan from, from uh, E to E prime uh, is some geodesic, if you want to think about it that way, from, uh, from the red flow to the blue flow. 
And satisfying the triangle inequality means that if I have an intermediate flow in green here, E double prime, it's always more expensive to go from red to green and green to blue than to go from red to blue directly. And once you have a triangle inequality, then you can start to triangulate your space. And even though I don't have coordinates on the space, even though all I'm giving you are pairwise distances, from those pairwise distances by themselves, you can triangulate a space and study the geometric properties of that space. Okay, so let me show you what this looks like in movie form. So hopefully Zoom will, will collaborate with me today. Yes, okay, today it's showing my movie. So what are you seeing here? So here you're seeing three jets or equivalently three energy flows. And uh, those are shown, the, we have the red jet, we have the green jet, we have the blue jet. And the lines here are showing you the transportation cost in units of, of giga electron volts for distorting one jet configuration to the other. What's shown in the middle is the optimal transport plan. This is like actual moving of the dirt. What's the most efficient way of, uh, of making the red look like the blue or the blue look like, like the, the green and, and, and going all around. And now with these movies and with these numbers, you have distances, pairwise distances between all jet configurations. And now you can again talk to your computational geometry experts and, uh, and ask them, uh, what am I supposed to do with this? So you might have some immediate concerns about this. So you know, one immediate concern you might have is, is OK, what about charge and flavor? You're just focusing on energy flow. Um, and there have been people who have uh, tried to uh, augment this story to include charge and flavor, but I'm not going to do that uh, here. Um, you might worry about, geez, this sounds really computationally expensive. I have to take all my collider events, compute all the pairwise distances. And these pairwise distances, you know, solving this optimal transport problem, that sounds really expensive. And the answer is yes. Uh, but there's great work coming out of the, the, the UC Santa Barbara group. Again, Nathaniel Craig gave a talk about this last week about computational uh, speed ups that you can do, which I'm happy to discuss more if people are interested. But putting aside the kind of computational question about how you actually compute these objects, what can you do once you have this emergent geometry, okay? an emergent geometry where I take the manifest geometry of rapidity and azimuth, I weight it by energy, and now I have this emergent geometry defined by this energy mover's distance. What are some things that I can do? Well, one thing that I can do is ask questions about, let's like, say, the dimensionality of this space. So I take a bunch of collider data, I take a bunch of jets, and I can ask, what's the dimensionality of the space of jets as triangulated by this new energy mover's distance? And you know, normally when we think about dimensionality, we think about dimensionality in terms of coordinates, uh, but there's actually a coordinate free way of talking about dimensionality that only depends on having pairwise distances. So in particular, if you study the number of neighbors that you have as a function of distance away from you, then the number of neighbors scales with the dimensionality of that space you're exploring. So for example, if you're in a city and you wanna know how many neighbors you have, well, as you scale out, then you know if you're if you're in Florence, you know you, you scale out the number of neighbors that you has uh, grows quadratically uh, with with distance. Unless you're in an apartment building, and then within that apartment building, actually your number of neighbors scales cubically. Okay, so actually there's a scale dependent notion of distance, and the distance can depend on the scale at which you're doing the resolution. So you can invert this formula and take the logarithmic derivative of the number of neighbors that you have with respect to the distance parameter. Um, and this is a way that people use, for example, to characterize the dimensionality of fractals. Um, and in this example here, um, we have a spiral data set where I have at small distance scales, a single point. It has no neighbors or no change in the number of neighbors as a function of distance. Everyone's socially distanced, you know, they're, they're two meters apart. And so the dimensionality is zero at this scale. I zoom out further and then I realize that my data points are arranged into a plane. I zoom out further and realize that my data points are really in a one dimensional structure. And I zoom out fully and then I have a more fully covered space. So I have a two dimensional space that eventually as I zoom further out becomes zero dimensional. So there's a scale dependent notion of distance. And now you can ask, well, what's this scale dependent notion of distance? What does this mean when I apply it to jets? And you know, we had no idea what to expect. This is a, a technique from data science <laughs> that we're importing into particle physics. What are we gonna get? Is there gonna be any physical meaning to this? And, and to our delight from the perspective of QCD, there really is a notion of scale dependence, scaling of dimensionality that maps onto some of the things that we might think about in terms of anomalous dimensions in, uh, in, in collider physics. So for example, um, if I'm at really high distances, uh, sorry, high energy scales, uh, then at high energy scales, basically all I'm resolving is a single quark or gluon. So my dimensionality of my space is zero. But then as I scale down, 
we have an evolution in the dimensionality. And that evolution, if you do a first principles kind of back of the envelope calculation, uh, it depends on the color factors that you're talking about. So quarks have a color factor of four thirds, gluons have, have a color factor of three. It depends on alpha S that basically tells you how fast do you get a growth of radiation in, in scale? And you get the expected logarithmic scaling in terms of the collision energy, oh, sorry, in terms of the resolution scale, depending on the, the transverse momentum of your depth that you're studying, uh, which is also kind of familiar from anomalous dimensions. And so you get this scaling as a, as a function of distance where, you know, if you take a 400 GeV jet and you evaluate it at, let's say, 10 GeV, the effective dimensionality is something like two, three, four, or five, depending on whether you're talking about quarks or gluons. And we can do that same analysis on public data from the CMS experiment. And that's a mixture of quarks and gluons. And you get this fascinating scaling behavior. Again, a kind of computer science or data science way of talking about things that we talk about in, in, uh, in field theory of things like anomalous dimensions. Uh, and so this is an example of starting to hint at this relevance of this technique from optimal transport theory, this technique from machine learning for maybe processing um, collider physics data. Um, let me show you one more uh, a plot about this um, and really try to show you this emergent space. So you have this space. Again, I take 30,000 jets. I calculate all pairwise interactions. That gives me distances. And then trying to triangulate the space that has a dimensionality that depends on scale. This is something that's very difficult to visualize, certainly very difficult to show on a single slide. Let me take that space and project it onto the slide here, project it onto 2D as best as I can. So there's a technique called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding that tries to take multi-dimensional objects and flatten them as best as they can, in this case, flattening to two dimensions. This gray blob here is a density plot of 30,000 jets. So there's 30,000 jets in this gray blob. And those jets are arranged such that their pairwise distances as measured by the EMD or as faithful as I can be to getting their distances uh, on, on the, the slide here. Um, and then sprinkled on top are 25 example jets, example jets that have been chosen to be most representative of the entire ensemble of 25. So this is an algorithm that's called k-metoids. So k in this case is 25. The 25 examples that do the best of representing what the uh, uh, data set as a whole uh, looks like. And so there's a real sense in which if you understood these 25 jets in full detail, you would understand all aspects of the 30,000. The size of these circles corresponds to um, the number of jets that these uh, things are representing. And the energy flow here is showing you know, what the energy flow is. And again, this is a, a completely data science-y way of processing uh, uh, information. There's no field theory in this representation. That's again, purely data science. But you can see that this data science strategy kind of organizes things in a way that's familiar, um, that this blob here, if I go in the color coding and I use uh, an observable that is you know, very common in jet physics, the invariant mass of a jet, you see that going from left to right, you go from blue to red, which goes from low jet mass to high jet mass. So you know, it's organizing things, at least in this one direction, as being kind of corresponding to this jet mass. Uh, but what about this other direction from top to bottom? And actually, it's pretty uh, pretty cool. Uh, going from top to bottom, uh, it's maybe hard to see on Zoom. Uh, but the jets at the bottom here have uh, asymmetric energy sharing, where there's a hard central core jet and then a soft subjet next to it. Whereas if I go to the top of this blob, I get more equal balance between the uh, between the two subjects, and that corresponds to an energy sharing variable that's often called Z. Uh, which is the foundation of the ultra-rayleigh Parisi splitting function, which is the way that we understand how jets are formed. So even though this data science uh, technique knows nothing about QCD or collider physics, it's organizing the information via this geometry in a way that corresponds to some of our intuition about how jets are formed and concepts from, from uh, quantum field theory about the divergent structure of gauge theories. Okay, so you know, viewed from this data science lens, this energy movers distance unlocks a suite of geometric analysis strategies. I told you about dimensionality. I told you about being able to kind of make visualizations of this data set. But you know, at this point, it should not be obvious why these optimal transport distances should be particularly well suited to collider applications. You know, this is just something from the data science community, this, this alien technology. <laughs> What does this have to do with what we already do in data analysis? You know, we have many different techniques that we've developed over the years. Why should we be interested in these particular ones? And so in the last part of this talk, 
I'm going to try to justify why these distances, this notion of distance, among all other ways that you might try to measure distances between collider data points, why this one is um, uh, uh, that does have a conceptual richness <laughs> beyond maybe what should be obvious at this point in the talk. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about is, is revealing a, uh, a hidden geometry. So I'm given a space, in particular, I'm given a metric space, a space that has some notion of pairwise distance. What's the first geometric object that you might think to construct given this, this uh, notion of a, of, a, of a geometry? Uh, well, the first geometric object that you'd want to create is probably just a point. And again, a point corresponds to an individual uh, uh, event or an individual energy flow. Um, the next thing you might want to construct is a set of, uh, of energy flows, or in this geometric picture, a manifold. Okay. So again, in this abstract space, you should be thinking about individual collider events and all the complications of this flow of energy from the collision point off to infinity as being represented now by a single point in this abstract space. And I can assemble a set of configurations that share some property, and that would then correspond to a manifold. And so, for example, I could take the set of all one particle manifolds. And for reasons that um, we don't fully understand, it turns out that whereas in collider physics applications, we're used to imposing energy momentum conservation, that is, we used to think about a single uh, center of mass, uh, a collision energy, um, and uh, only focus on things that have energy momentum conserved, it appears to leverage this energy mover's distance. Actually, you want to think about all possible n-particle configurations, even the ones that don't have energy momentum conservation built in. So that's why these flows that I'm showing here, one particle configurations, uh, don't impose uh, energy momentum conservation. And I can talk about towards the end why we think that that's actually a, 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 a reasonable thing to, to do. So the set of all one particle configurations, that's a, a manifold. Um, uh, a manifold in the sense of being locally equivalent to Euclidean space, because we actually know that this corresponds to uh, some kind of Lorentz invariant one body phase space. Um, you can also talk about two particle manifolds, uh, but the way that I've drawn this two particle manifold, that is all possible two particle configurations, it's a superset of the one particle manifold. And why is it a superset? It's a superset because if I take one of these particles and make it zero energy, I can't tell the difference between that and just having one particle. That's the infrared safety of this representation. Or if I take two particles and I put them on top of each other, um, I can't tell that they are different. Again, we're just focusing on the flow of energy, not the specific details of the particles that are participating. Similarly, I can build a three particle manifold. And again, you have this nested structure where the n particle is a strict superset of the n minus one and so on and so forth down to the one particle manifold. And uh, this nesting structure is enforced by uh, soft and collinear limits of QCD. So this is kind of an interesting structure to explore, um, interesting manifolds that you might want to construct. And it's particularly interesting when we start to think about what we often do in, in, in collider physics, we want to do first principles calculations uh, in perturbative field theory. And what is this notion of nested manifolds? What does this have to do with the way that we use perturbative field theory calculations? And, and the answer is, okay, well, when are two events exactly the same? So as far as the energy flow is concerned, Energy flow is unchanged by infinitesimal soft and collinear emissions. So if I take a jet and I ask, add a zero energy particle, or I take a particle and split it into two, these are the two singularities of, of, of gauge theories. What's done in this energy flow picture, this emergent geometry energy movers distance picture, is that it forces infrared divergences associated with the z goes to zero and theta goes to zero limit. It forces those divergences to live together. So if I'm doing a calculation of some n body scattering process and I have a virtual divergence, there's going to be an n plus one body real emission diagram. And in the z goes to zero limit and the theta goes to zero limit, where via the ultra early prezi splitting functions, we know we have soft and collinear divergences, those divergences become overlapping. That is, these, these divergences live together in this space. Where the real uh, 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 emission divergences are and where the virtual emission divergences are are kind of overlapping. So in this space, actually, there are no divergences. <laughs> Of course, this is not the way that we usually do quantum field theory calculations. We usually do quantum field theory calculations where we do the n body separate from the n plus one body, and we have to do complicated subtraction procedures in order to make these things overlap. But at least in principle, in this induced geometry, uh, there is no issue about these singularities coexisting. And so what this means from a, a more formal perspective 
is that the concept of infrared and collinear safety, the concept that tells you when an observable is calculable in perturbation theory, perturbative quantum field theory, that this concept is continuity in this EMD induced space. So continuity in the sense of if I have two energy flows and these energy flows are similar as measured by the EMD within some ball of delta, then an infrared and collinear safe observable will always be bounded such that the difference in the value of that infrared and collinear safe observable is bounded by some amount epsilon. And the reason why there's an asterisk here is that if you ask your computational geometry experts about continuity, they'll tell you, well, actually, there's all sorts of different notions of continuity that you can have. Um, and you can have continuity you know, everywhere, but at a set of measure zero, you can have continuity, you can hold your continuity, there's Lipschitz constants that you can have, and all those different notions of continuity, and I have this in the backup slides, correspond to actually different definitions that people have had in infrared and collinear safety over the years. And uh, I think I saw uh, that, uh, that that George Sturman was on the uh, 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 on the call here. And actually, what, what George proposed in the 1970s, uh, what he proposed corresponds to uh, what's in this language, holder continuity. And that corresponds to, in some sense, the most calculable that you can get in perturbative quantum field theory. And if you relax that notion of continuity, there's actually different types of calculations that you can do, nevertheless, uh, in the context of quantum field theory. Um, but again, these different notions of continuity tell you different things about how calculable something is or is not in a, a QFT framework. Okay, so this was a, a surprise to us that now you start to see, oh wait, now that you have this geometry, you can now formalize questions that we have in the quantum field theory context. And it feels like this EMD is giving us a natural geometry to describe massless gauge theories. On the other hand, there are tons of open questions about, well, how would you use this in practice? You know, when we typically do scattering amplitudes, we do scattering amplitudes where there's a fixed multiplicity. In this EMD picture, multiplicity is not something that you get to play with. Um, as I said, there's this nesting of n particle, n minus one, n minus two body phase space. What do you even mean by amplitudes in this space? And even more so, like, what does it mean to integrate in this space? If I want to do a cross-section calculation, like, how would I do it in this space? So I have no idea the answer to these questions. Um, but there seems to be a hint that this 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 emd is getting us closer to an understanding of kind of what the space that massless gauge theories inhabit um again all stemming from this idea that the natural way to represent re represent my information in collider physics is by this energy flow primitive and then this energy flow primitive merged together with this emd gives us a new uh a way of thinking about these issues in a geometric strategy okay so that's the most formal thing that i wanted to tell you about kind of connections to things that we've been doing, you know, a half century ago. Uh, what are some other things that this geometry uh, allows you to do? So once you have manifolds, now you can start to say, hey, if I have a set of events, what can I do with that set of events? And one of the things you can do is you can build observables from this. So if I have an event and I want to compare that to a set of events, a natural thing to do is to figure out the distance of closest approach between that one event and that set of events. This distance of closest approach takes a pairwise distance. That's what the EMD is, a pairwise distance between things in this, in this space. But now I'm gonna minimize over all uh, uh, elements of this manifold, uh, find the one that's closest to the event in question. So this is a distance of closest approach, um, essentially an impact parameter between that event and that whole manifold. And this is something that allows me to use the EMD to build observables. Okay, so let's go back to one of the classic observables that uh, shows up in uh, on QCD, studied in E plus E minus collision. So this event here is from, from an, uh, a collision at, at Aleph. Uh, and if I'm doing Aleph data analysis, uh, I might want to study uh, how diegetic-like uh, collisions are at, the, uh, at, at, at LEP. And so what do I want to do? I want to know how diegetic-like is an event. So what does it mean to ask how diegetic-like is an event? Well, you can imagine building the manifold of all possible back-to-back -back two particle configurations. Um, and then with that manifold of all possible back-to-back -back two particle configurations, you can ask, hey, my event that I'm studying, how close is it to that back-to-back -back two particle manifold? And you get two things out. One, you get the location of closest approach. That gives your, you your best uh, estimate of what the back-to-back -back two particle configuration is. And this is actually where this issue of energy momentum conservation comes in. Um, because oftentimes the best way of approximating uh, an event is not one that can manifestly conserves energy momentum. That is, they can be back to back, but with differing energies. That can be a, a good representation of the event as overall. And then you have a distance itself. 
And again, this is a distance that's defined in this abstract geometric picture. And you might say, well, what does this have to do at all with things that we've already studied in the field? Well, it turns out that this particular distance is what has already been measured uh, many times over the years at E plus E minus colliders, namely observable called thrust. So this T here defined an optimal transport language. It's the optimal transport between my event E and all possible back-to-back -back two particle configurations and finding the minimum one. This is equivalent to what we already do with thrust, where thrust is trying to find the axis that best aligns with the dominant flow of radiation. And these formulas are the same. One's defined in terms of this emergent geometry. The other one is defined in terms of the manifest geometry of collider data. These things are the same, which is why I call this talk the hidden geometry of particle collisions. We're already using this geometric language, even though we didn't know it. This also allows us to define new quantities um, based on this geometric picture. So um, in work with Kerry Cicerotti, we wanted to ask the opposite question, not whether events are kind of back-to-back -back and jet-like, but maybe events could be isotropic. This could be relevant for, for example, new physics searches where you think you might have an, a, a new physics scenario that gives you more isotropic radiation patterns. So how do you define it in this way? Well, in this way, you would define a distance to the most uniform event configuration possible, namely uniform radiation. And then you can calculate the optimal transport distance between uh, that energy flow and the uniform event configuration. And this has an incredible dynamic range in terms of its ability to separate out dijet configurations from 10 body phase space, from 25 body phase space, and 50 body phase space. Why? Well, a perfectly uniform radiation pattern is actually quite difficult to achieve in, in, in field theory. And so you get a really large dynamic range in terms of your ability to separate out different degrees of isotopy. Um, and uh, Carrie's been working with Matt Reese and Matt Strassler on ways of actually using this for characterizing uh, of various beyond the standard model scenarios. And it's been kind of quite remarkable um, how many things that we're so used to talking about in our field have a natural geometric language. And I'll, I'll go through some of these in more detail. So in a sense, the kind of smoothness in the space of events, um, this idea of infrared and collinear safety, uh, you know, these things are, are, are linked together. And, and to my mind, give you the most formal way of, of defining what infrared and collinear safety means. I talked about event shapes like thrust, sphorosity also has this form of being able to be written in terms of this minimum distance to some manifold. And I'll talk a little bit about jets, jet substructure and pilot mitigation. But you know, the hope is that not only do we have six decades of collider physics in this language, but, but maybe the next six decades would be inspired by some of these geometric strategies, of which this event isotropy is one example of a geometric data analysis strategy that's enabled by this uh, EMD perspective. So, um, let me just spend my remaining time just kind of giving you more examples uh, of, of this, and then I'll take uh, happy to take questions about how, how far down this rabbit hole really goes. So one of the things that I did uh, actually soon after I arrived at MIT you know, a decade ago, uh, worked with a fantastic then undergrad student, uh, now, now faculty member, Ken Van Tilburg, on uh, defining uh, an observable called n sub jettiness. And uh, n sub jettiness is a ubiquitous jet substructure observable that's used to characterize the degree to which a jet has n prong substructure. And I remember a decade ago going around giving talks about this and you know, people wondering, geez, why this particular form for n sub jettiness? So n sub jettiness is the degree to which radiation is along, aligned along n subjet axis. So you have to minimize over the choice of axes, in this case shown by these uh, uh, blue x's. And then you have to calculate uh, the distance to, from all your particles to that particular axis of, 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 of choice and then weighted by energy. And you can do this for three sub jettiness, two sub jettiness, use this to do discriminants for jet substructure and try to tell the difference between boosted top quarks and W bosons and quark and gluon jets and so on, in the physics, okay. But there was a sense in which this formula seemed kind of arbitrary. You know, we were inspired by work by Stuart Tackman and, and Valavine on n-jettiness. We were inspired by the previous literature by Brent and Damon on uh, different ways of characterizing kind of n-prong-like substructure. And you might ask, hey, with this new optimal transport perspective, Maybe there's a cleaner way of talking about this because somehow what n sub jettiness is trying to do is to say, hey, how close is my jet that I'm studying to being an n particle like configuration? It looks like it should be the distance of closest approach between a point, that is my jet that I'm studying, and the manifold of all possible n particle configurations. And the answer is that it is, like literally it is, with that equal sign. So this crazy formula here, which seems a little bit arbitrary, 
that is what we were doing. We were finding the minimum distance uh, between a point and a manifold in this space. And this also explains why NJDiness is used, for example, um, in doing precision calculations as a type of subtraction scheme. Why? Because it's connected to this idea of infrared and collinear safety. Um, and so secretly, we didn't know this, uh, but we were actually doing, once again, this kind of hidden geometry problem uh, of calculating this point to manifold uh, EMD. And again, we take a formula that was long and now we make it half as long by this geometric insight. Um, there's other things that uh, turn out to involve particle manifolds. So I mentioned n jettiness itself is the distance of closest approach to the n particle manifold. There's ways of defining jet finding as finding a point of closest approach to an n particle manifold. It's to say I have a collider event. I want to summarize it in terms of n jets. But what do I do? I just project it down, a dimensionality reduction by projecting it down to this uh, n particle manifold. And then, you know, the workhorse of collider physics uh, you know, since the 1990s uh, has been uh, the sequential jet recombination schemes of which anti-KT is the most recent iteration of this. And you might say, geez, what are sequential jet recombination schemes? Those seem like graph structures. That doesn't seem at all like an optimal transport problem. Well, it turns out that you can interpret these sequential jet recombination schemes as iteratively projecting your configuration step-by-step from an n particle manifold to n minus one to n minus two, and sequential jet recombination can actually also be written in this geometric language. So that's kind of wild that, again, all these things have a geometric interpretation. And uh, the, the last thing that I, I'll talk about, which is more experimentally relevant, is something that, again, doesn't seem all that geometric. So at colliders like the LHC, we don't just slam together pairs of protons at a time. We slam together multiple protons at the same time, where you have somewhere between, you know, let's say, 5 and 25 simultaneous collisions per bunch crossing. And you might have an event of interest, but then overlaid on that event, you have all these events that are not of interest. And we have quasi-uniform event contamination coming from overlapping proton-proton collisions. What can this mean in a geometric language? So we have my event that I, uh, of, of interest, and it's been contaminated. And then I have this idealized configuration of uniform contamination. And what I want to do, I want to move away from that uniform contamination. And so what you can literally do is follow a geodesic in this abstract space, follow a geodesic from the uniform through your event and, and extrapolate out uh, until you're no longer contaminated. And pilot mitigation turns out to correspond to moving away from this uniform event, basically extrapolating a geodesic uh, in this abstract space. And so these uh, images here are kind of these stained glass windows uh, are different techniques that are already in the literature. So Voronoi tessellation and constituent subtraction, these turn out to be approximate ways of doing this uh, geodesic uh, extrapolation. And actually, in the computational geometry world, uh, the strict uh, energy movers distance uh, corresponds to something that's called Apollonius subtraction uh, that, uh, that we're investigating right now to try to understand uh, its relevance for LHC collider applications. But once again, a kind of a surprise that something that seems very, I don't know, ad hoc or experimental turns out to have this beautiful geometric picture uh, attached to it. And uh, again, we hope that this could uh, help us in terms of understanding uh, uh, you know, field theory and collider physics in a more deep way. So kind of just summarizing uh, this last part of the talk, uh, we're just beginning to leverage this kind of conceptual richness, richness of optimal transport for high energy physics applications. And uh, there's an interesting coda to the story if people want to stick around. Uh, you can ask me how far down this rabbit hole goes, uh, but actually uh, kind of leveraging the same type of conceptual richness, uh, uh, even for applications that are even further afield from the things that I've talked about already. Um, but I think my hour is up, so let me uh, kind of summarize here. So this was a, 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 a story that involved three parts. First, I wanted to remind you that this energy flow concept uh, is a useful way of restricting our attention to infrared and collinear safe information. And it's a theoretically motivated data analysis strategy. It's motivated by the structure of gauge theories and quantum field theory. Once you have this notion of energy flow, you can now define distances between pairs of energy flows, and that's this energy movers distance that we introduced. And this optimal transport picture allows us to triangulate the space of collider events and define a type of emergent geometry. And at first glance, this emergent geometry might seem to have nothing to do with what we've already done in collider physics, but actually, no. Uh, we can actually gain a new perspective on concepts, concepts and techniques in quantum field theory and collider physics from the last half century. They actually have a natural interpretation in this geometric language. And it would be really exciting to see uh, how these things now extrapolate into the future now that we have this new geometric toolkit.
So with that, uh, thank you very much. Looking forward to your questions and, and thanks to, uh, to GGI for the opportunity to present this, uh, this work at the Steve break. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Jesse, for this very nice and interesting talk. And uh, the table is open for questions now. If you have a question, please raise your hand here in Zoom and uh, I will allow you to speak. So let's wait. Uh, I already see one raised hand. I will give uh, the opportunity to ask the question in a second. In the meantime, please keep raising your hand if you have uh, other questions. So the first question is from uh, George Sturman and uh, you should be. Oh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. Yeah. To do it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Very, very great talk and such interesting developments. In the definition of the Earth Movers, the EMD, okay? Yeah. Um, well, first, a technical thing. For the thrust, you, just, you related it on the right-hand side of the equality to something called EMD2. Ah, yes. Was the two, yeah, uh, was... Yeah. Uh, I guess two is two particles or something. What, what's that two? No, good, excellent. Thank you, George. Okay, so, uh, so, so George, you worked on angularities, right? Uh, well, that was in yeah. yeah, yeah. But angularities have a parameter a in it that tells oh. you basically uh, an angular uh, a scaling relationship. Um, and the original Earth mover's distance uh, corresponds to raising angles to the first power. So that's called the one Wasserstein metric. If you uh -huh. raise angles to the second power, that's called the two Wasserstein metric. And the two Wasserstein metric is what that two is here. And that basically says, I, I look at distances squared. Oh, like so, one minus theta, one minus cosine theta is theta squared over two. And that's the two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, two. And it, it, so yeah. you can, and, and so, so your original EMD was not the only EMD. It's not always theta ij. That is correct. And in fact, taking theta ij raised to any positive power, that corresponds to actually sweeping through your angularities. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and so right. all the various angularities actually correspond to that. And so it's really interesting. You know that there's like different behaviors with this theta um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's like recoil sensitivity effects and, and in soft collinear effective theory going between SCT2 and SCT1. All that comes into this, the power that you raise theta to. The original power was theta to the first power. That's the one Wasserstein, the default earth mover's distance. Raising that to a different power corresponds to the different angularities of which thrust corresponds to uh, raising it to the second power. And the first power actually corresponds to uh, the work that um, uh, Howard George did on sporosity, which is right. kind of interesting. Uh, Absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Our end of, oops. Very good. Okay. So, any other question? Please raise your hand. So, maybe uh, while we wait for other questions, uh, just you can tell us more about the last part. You gave us three examples. Well, the end subjectiveness, I, I remember these complicated equations and uh, uh, Oh, sorry, there is a question. So I give priority to, to the audience. So there is a question yeah. from Vittorio Del Duca. Hi. So yes. Uh, hi, Jesse. Um, I have a question about, uh, as you mentioned before, there is being work on um, multi point energy correlators, like uh, triple energy correlator, energy energy correlator, and so on. So, in what, what do you learn from them in this uh, geometric picture? Uh, excellent. So, um, as I mentioned uh, uh, here, there's been an explosion of interest here. I'm just showing two point energy correlators, but explosion of theoretical interest in, in studying multi point energy correlators. And right now, we don't have a way of relating these energy correlators to this new geometric picture. I think the probably the right way of saying it is that the fundamental thing that we should all remind ourselves about is the power of this energy flow operator then what you do with that energy flow operator, we can build all sorts of things. So one of the things that you do is study these multi-point energy correlators, and that seems to be a hugely rich field. Another thing that you can do is you can do these optimal transport distances, which are related to um, this geometric structure that I, that I uh, uh, talked about in this talk. 
But at the moment, we don't have a real good um, mapping uh, between these multipoint energy correlators and this geometric picture, apart from now the statement that we can make more robustly about what the definition of infrared and collinear safety is. So um, normally we don't worry about infrared and collinear safety in terms of these energy uh, multipoint energy correlators because they're uh, infrared and collinear safe by construction. Um, but this issue of like exactly the precise definition of infrared and collinear safety and continuity um, that you can now address uh, with respect to these multipoint energy correlators. Um, but I would say that the real kind of focal point is this idea of this energy flow concept. And that by itself is, is from my mind, worth the price of admission. Um, and now I've just showed you how, if you're a computational geometer or a, or a data scientist, what you would then do with it. But of course, we in particle physics can decide to measure multipoint energy correlators, which by itself is an interesting thing to do. But I don't yet have a, a true geometric understanding of, of what those objects are in this picture. But it's something that I've been thinking about, but don't have much useful to say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. OK, great. Um, so if anybody from the audience has other questions, please feel free to raise your hand. In the meantime, I can continue with my curiosity before. So in the last part of the talk, uh, you uh, showed this nice interpretation of the complicated looking equation for dense objectiveness. Uh, is there any other, I, I remember this expression very well when Ken Beck was telling me uh, 10 years ago, and then uh, it's been very nice to have this, uh, this interpretation. Do you have any, any other case where there is such a nice geometrical interpretation for other variables that seem quite ad hoc and then you have a nice visualization yeah. of what you are. Yeah, so um, I, 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 in fact, I've told you about all of the ones that I know apart from one, okay? So uh, I to told you about thrust, ferocity, KT jet clustering, cambridge Aachen jet clustering, and subjettiness and jettiness, the x cone jet algorithm, constituent subtraction. Um, so I, I've told you about all the ones that are simple there's other things that you can do very naturally um with this um uh but uh uh there, there are no other examples that i can give you uh that are um of, of, of observables that you know uh apart from the thing i was telling george about which is angularities and angularities is the same thing only the distance to a one particle manifold um, so those are the ones which, uh, which have a nice geometric interpretation. Um, I could talk about the going down the rabbit hole further and things that are, that are maybe less, you know, they're, they're not observables in the same way. And maybe we can do that, uh, in a moment, but I've given you all the examples that, uh, that I know of, uh, that have this nice picture. And, and this kind of spans a space of, uh, of types of things that we do in collider physics already, but all, all of them to have this thing, there has to be an optimization involved somewhere. Here it's an optimization as a minimum. There has to be an optimization somewhere in this problem. Um, otherwise it doesn't have this nice uh, nice geometric picture. And the ones I've talked about are in some sense, the space of all optimization problems or the ones that at least are commonly used in particle physics. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. We have George Sturman that raised the hand again. So please George, go ahead. Okay, hi, sorry to... <laughs> use up all this time, but you mentioned in passing the possibility of combining these ideas with uh, flavor, a charge, kind mm. of non-infrared safe. Where should one look yeah. to see what's what's been thought about and, and, and put out there Yeah, that approach? Yeah, so th there's this flavored variant um, by a Portuguese group. Um, and I'll make these slides available and you can click on this link where they, they include charge and flavor information in there. Um, but in some ways, this is a, a, a fundamental problem that we have, <laughs> which is how do you define charge and flavor in a way that's computable in quantum field theory? Mm -hmm. um, and so a very natural thing to say is, oh, I want to have the, the flow of charge. Why don't I, what, you know, what, what stops me from replacing the team you knew here why don't I just replace this with JMU? You know, why can't I just talk about the flow of, of, of charge or flavor? What stops me from doing that? And the thing that stops me from doing that is that if you have a massless gauge theory, let's just say QED with massless electrons, 
there's nothing to stop me from popping out a zero energy photon that then splits to an E plus E minus pair. And those E plus E minus pairs can go anywhere in the, in the soft limit. And therefore the flow of charge is something where I'm, I don't get, I don't have control at order alpha electromagnetic squared. And this is well known. Uh, this is the reason why charge and flavor is very, very delicate. Um, there's been people who have who've tried to figure out infrared and collinear safe um, definitions of, of charge and flavor, but it's, but it's challenging and delicate. Um, and I'm not aware of, of any natural way of doing this. That said, um, if you're willing to study unsafe information, which is of course something that we, we do all the time, um, there's a whole field in computational geometry of multi uh, category optimal transport, where you can imagine having dirt of different flavors. And so you can imagine having electron like dirt and muon like dirt and actually having a, an exchange rate for converting electron type dirt to muon type dirt. Or you have k on type dirt and pi on type dirt, and you can like you know pay pay an exchange rate to convert one to the other. So there's a rich literature and a growing literature on the optimal transport side, but it, but in some sense this is a fundamental field theory question, which is when we talk about charge and flavor, how do we want to talk about that? What are the objects that we want to do? What's the primitive? And once you give me a primitive, as long as that primitive is a density, we can repeat the same story uh, again in terms of this uh, this optimal transport language. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other question? So I do not see any other question in the in the participants, not even in the chat. Okay, so I think we can close this tea break here. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, again, for accepting our invitation and your, for your very nice talk. And uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, and the next GGI tea break will be announced in the website and the mailing list. Okay, bye bye, everybody. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks. Right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.